do this. So, hi guys, thanks so much for having me. I'm um, actually over here in Perth, um, so same time zone, and still within the Asian region, just um, down here, down below. And today I'm going to have a chat to you um, about sales and storytelling. Um, and I've been listening to some of the previous speakers, you know, and there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're probably going to hear a little bit more of, but I'm hopefully going to simplify it in a way that um, is really focusing around that sales aspect of it alone. So a quick agenda, um, intros, me, um, uh, why content is all about sales. Um, sales uh, Rebecca, just, just hang on. Uh, is it possible for you to exit presentable and to go into full screen mode? Because I believe some people yeah. might not be able to see it if it's too small. Uh, I'm sorry, give me a second. Yeah. Which, view, uh, which view am I going into? Oh, let's try down here. Full screen. Nope. There, how's that? All right, yeah, that's perfect. All right, that please proceed. Okay. Yep. Beautiful. Um, and also talking about what this all means in the post-pandemic world, you know, which I know is obviously the, um, the big topic here and the good news, because there's plenty of it, um, and some of the stuff that you need to focus on and a quick run through as well of the tools. Some of this you're going to know, so bear with me and then um, time for questions at the end as well. So who am I? Um, I've been doing content for a very long time now. Uh, I'm staying a little bit long in the tooth on this one. Um, I started out in journalism. Um, so storytelling's always been a very big part of what I've done. I've spent a couple of years, uh, three years, in fact, working up in Asia. I worked with um, Staff TV. I spent some time in Burma. I also ended up at one of the original content marketing agencies called King Content, uh, which was fantastic. I got to work with a lot of global clients. Um, I've gone in-house, worked at um, one of WA's biggest insurers um, and travel organisations, and I'm now with Pay for Spark, the agency. Um, but it's funny, when I start thinking about my experience, I really have covered a lot of industries, you know. So those ones I've just thrown down the bottom, non-profit, technology, lots of tech startup, mining, very big in Australia, obviously banking, travel, you know, Star TV, a lot of the stuff I was doing there was around travel, um, insurance, finance. And the one thing I can say is that even if something's really, really dry, you can find a way to tell a story and by telling a story um, also create some sales. So I think that's one of the key messages that I've got um, for you guys today. So I'm currently with Paper and Spark. Um, we're a national, Australian national organisation. We work with some very big um, clients, very big name clients, lots of healthcare um, and pharma, uh, lots of finance. And over here in WA, I've also got some um, uh, like universities and um, utilities. So we have a kind of a really strong mix of B2B, but really strong on that B2C aspect as well. And those two audiences are different in sales, but the, the the general premise is always the same. And just quickly about the paper and spark approach, because I think, again, you would have heard a lot about this, this kind of stuff over the last couple of days. And the reason you're hearing a lot about it is because this is your best practice. You know, we very much use a lot of data and insights um, in order to drive content decisions. You know, storytelling might be at the heart, but you still really need that data and insights to understand your audience. Um, we're all about an integrated ecosystem. You know, it's, it's not about one channel, it's got to be many channels. And the message really importantly has to actually be consistent across all those channels. You've got to be strategic. Um, I'm, we're really big at no noise. You know, it's very easy as a content creator to get caught up with the creative idea and forget whether or not it's actually really helping your audience. It can be the world's best idea, but it just might not be right for your product um, and service. And then test and optimise, test and optimise. I heard the previous speaker just talking about that exactly. Um, you have the power these days to do this. In some ways, marketing's actually never been easier and sales in some ways never been easier. You've never known so much about your customers. So you've got to use that. So how does content fit with sales? Look, it's really interesting. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I was talking to one of the business development guys at one of the agencies I worked with. He said, oh, you're really good at sales. And I went, oh, no, I'm, I'm a creative. I'm a content creator. I'm a storyteller. And he laughed and he said, people often think of sales the wrong way. But basically, um, you're not selling. What you're actually doing is solving someone's problem. Um, and that just really resonated with me um, because that's usually what you're doing with content. You know, content is designed to solve someone's problem. It's designed to provide them with information. It's designed to stop them from being bored by entertaining them. Basically, content is sales, you know, and if your content is right, if it's solving your audience's problem, you're also likely going to be solving a problem that can lead to a sale. So it's about linking those things together and um, letting telling that story of how you're going to solve your prospective customer's problem. It's really that simple. And I think if you bring everything back, you know, um, particularly in digital, there's so many tools and so much stuff you can do. 
bring it back to that one premise. You have a customer, how are you gonna solve their problem? And then how do you talk about that across different channels? And then how do you tell that story at different stage of your sales funnel as well? And just so we're clear too, um, sorry, I know I talk quickly, but I'm conscious of time. Just so we're also clear, um, content these days, particularly in a digital ecosystem, is absolutely everything. It's your Facebook ads, it's your above the line ads, it's your FAQs on your website, it's the post sales information you give them. All of that is content. So I wouldn't get too hung up on what's marketing, what sales and what's content. It's all together. And content is really about how you're telling that story. So <clears throat> there's also the sales funnel out there. And I think the digital ecosystem has certainly shifted that around. The, the first one to the left, I think, has been around since 1894. And look, it, it absolutely does hold true today. And it's still really the one I use when I'm thinking about the stages that a customer might be going through. There's awareness, there's interest, there's decision, there's action. The other one here, which has become really um, popular these days is the uh, marketing life cycle. Um, and look, that also works, you know, because digital has changed that life cycle because of that extra loyalty um, factor that I think digital is really, really powerful at bringing in, um, in terms of people repeat um, customers and what they can also say about you. So, but don't get too hung up on it. Um, again, there is so much stuff out there. I think it's really easy to lose sight of what your basic premise is, and that is you're going to solve some Someone's problem. So as long as you're thinking about how you're solving someone's problem at these different aspects, use whatever funnel you like, whatever funnel works for you, your product or your service. Um, there's also the customer journey, which again, you know, has become really popular these days as well. And again, it's really, really accurate. You know, all of these models kind of work. Um, I do particularly like this one. I think it's pretty funny in a way because it's from 2012, which is why I've left the date down the bottom, because it's 2020, you know, and we're, we're always talking about all this change. And yet so much of this customer journey actually still um, rings true in the digital um, space, you know, particularly that buy, consume, influence circle that people go through and particularly as well, that search and discover stage that they start with. So again, don't get too caught up on the hype, the technology, the too many theories. It's a lot of the old practices remain absolutely um, steadfast in terms of the right way to do it. Keep things simple wherever you can. Um, and then the other thing I love about so many of the customer journeys out there is that they actually start showing you how this is going to actually fit um, in a customer's real life. Like this is just one example I grabbed. Um, it certainly doesn't even show you all the tools that you could potentially use. You know, certainly um, the previous speaker, you know, was talking about virtual reality. That's not on here. You know, so there's always new tools that are, that are coming in. But I think what really... so. It, what you need to focus on is that awareness, consideration, purchase, retention and advocacy stages, which is the one I'm going to stick with today in terms of the customer journey. Um, and I, again, I stick with this one because I like the fact you've got the advocacy because in the digital world, very much your customers can become your advocates and that's one of your biggest selling strong points. Um, but the tools are gonna to change. Um, you know, there was a couple of these I found from a few years ago, and it was all about events, events, events. You know, in a post-pandemic world, some of that in-person contact at this point in time is just, just not happening. Um, you know, social ads and PPC, all of these things change in terms of their importance. Community forums, massive a few years ago, maybe not as massive always at the moment, certainly for some services and products, but not everyone. So there's no golden rule in terms of the tools. Um, but the golden rule remains that these are the stages you need to think about your customer and then what's that, what's that selling message that you're giving them and how does that selling message come through in the content in everything you're saying to them. So how has things changed in a post-pandemic world? Well, lots of things have changed, but lots of things haven't changed. Change is a constant, but at the same time, you know, some are you know, just the way life cycle marketing or, you know, the sales funnel remains the same, a lot remains the same. One thing that has changed certainly as everyone's had to go and hide from home is that digital's become everything. Um, there's been numerous articles written about this recently. A really good example I read the other day was um, from Mark Ritson, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, brilliant marketer, talking about his wife's yoga teacher um, who had 
um, gone online during the pandemic, typically used to drive around to their remote home and, and, and provide a yoga class and now had gone online. And post now everything was opening back up in Australia at least and, and that he was allowed to go and visit clients again. I thought, no, I quite like this online experience. So I'm gonna continue charging my $20 and continue doing the online classes. The problem with that was, was that he's now in competition with every other yoga teacher that's online. So um, digital has become um, everything, but the barrier to entry is lower than ever before. And what that means is that the noise in the digital marketplace is absolutely overwhelming. Um, and I think it's always been that way, but it's probably really, really um, picked up a bit um, recently, you know, and I'm sure if you even consider how many webinars you've been invited to over the past couple of months, it's, you know, lots and lots of digital noise. So that's probably the biggest change. Um, it's harder to get cut through. The other thing, um, interestingly, I was reading a study by McKinsey that's happening is that there's a lot less loyalty. There was something like 60% of people, during, particularly during the pandemic, had indicated that they were really happy to try a different product or service. Um, so that whole concept of loyalty um, might be again disappearing. Now that's also an opportunity, right? Because if people are feeling less loyal to your competitor, they might just give you a go. So wherever there's you know, a barrier, there's also opportunity. So if you've got a really noisy marketplace, um, loyalty is not a given anymore. The question is what's going to make you stand out? What's gonna make your sales pitch stand out? So according to McKinsey, what people are after at the moment are value, availability and quality. So in a post pandemic world, I would be looking at what is it that my product gives? What's the problem for someone um, that my product can solve or my service can solve? And really narrow that down, narrow it down to a sentence. So you're really clear on what that proposition is um, because it's about, again, as the previous speaker said, it's about proposition, it's not about um, product. So what is that proposition? And then also look at it through this lens of value, availability and quality and have a think about how you can possibly incorporate that in. If that's what people, people are after, answer their need. Um, so that's more of a kind of a macro theme, but it's certainly one to keep in mind. So the other thing that's going to help you get cut through at the moment is creativity. Creativity and also insights. So you need to be able to stand out from the crowd. You know, it's a noisy marketplace. And what helps you stand out from the crowd is great storytelling, something that cuts through, something that speaks to the person. And the other thing that's going to help you um, create good content is insights. Again, you have the data, you have all of the information about your customers, use it. And, and again, test and learn what works, what doesn't, what messages are working, what messages are not working um, and change them. You, your fundamental proposition around what the problem is that you're going to solve shouldn't change, but how you might um, direct that message, that sales pitch is going to change. So what this kind of means is it's about good content and it's also importantly, um, which is less about content, is really good digital design. You know, reduce the barriers, make it easy, um, really make it easy for people to go all the way through. And I'll talk to a couple of examples about that. So in my mind, as well as being really creative, it's also about getting back to basics. So if you want cut through at the moment, be very creative, really know your audience, but get back to basics and get it right at each stage of your marketing or sales funnel. What's your message? Who are you talking to? And what are they gonna resonate with? So what I'm gonna do now is run through kind of each of the um, areas where um, you need to start thinking of each of the sales um, sections, the sales funnel. And the first one is obviously awareness. Um, so people are going to find you by search and they're going to um, discover you. Um, so remember, we're in a very noisy marketplace at the moment. So you've got a heap of digital tools at your disposal. And I know you heard, guys heard about CEO, SEO yesterday. I'm not going to tell you how to do SEO, but if you haven't got that right as a fundamental, get back to basics, you're not going to sell anything because <laughs> no one's going to come and find you, you know, so you've really um, got to remember that all of these digital tools are also sales tools for you and to make sure you're getting them right. Um, voice is another really cool one. There's some great stuff happening in voice. We're doing some work with voice um, with a couple of brands in Australia, actually. A lot of what we're doing is less around necessarily generating sales and more at this point in time around generating brand awareness, but certainly where that, that technology is going to head, it's going to become one of those um, great search technologies. Um, word of mouth, I think that's, you know, that's kind of everything. Social media, social media is both a, a discover and a search function, you know, hugely powerful tool. 
um, and digital advertising, influencer marketing, never going away. It's always been around in some form or not. Paid media, again, you get so much information um, from paid media. Um, audience targeting is another really, really big one. And it is a tool in its own right. And that's all that data that you've got and that ability you've got to target a social media ad, to target a paid ad to your specific audience. And also social listening um, can be hugely valuable. Can, it can also not be valuable, but I actually think from a sales and um, product perspective, social listening is really valuable because it can give you the chance to um, tweak your product or tweak your sales message to, you know, to really hear what people are talking about. Um, and a good example I was talking with one of my colleagues about with this yesterday um, was Subway, which was a client she previously worked on. And they had done some social listening and heard that um, lots of the customers were chatting about some sweet and sour sauce and they loved it. And it had been a previous thing and they, they just loved the sweet and sour sauce and it wasn't a pity. They bought it back. They based a whole campaign around it and they bought back the sweet and sour sauce and it was a massive, massive hit and they made a heap of sales. And it was literally just by listening into what people are talking about. So really what I'm saying in this awareness stage, um, what you need to do is to understand what it is, again, back to your proposition, what's the problem that you can solve for your audience? And then what you're trying to do here, both through the push um, and through the pull, is show that your audience that you can solve that problem. Um, this is the one stage where probably trying more, you know, more is better because you don't always know um, which of these channels is going to connect. And creativity is absolutely critical here. This is where, um, particularly in this discovery phase, they're going to click on an ad that catches their attention. And um, that, so this, this is where creativity is definitely the most important. Um, really keep that in mind. Don't put out a boring ad at this point in time. Don't put too much boring stuff on social media if you're gonna put paid behind it. It won't get cut through. Try and get that proposition front and center and use your storytelling. Use your storytelling to explain to someone why it's going to work. Now, um, I've actually come up with a bit of um, an example here. And this is actually just something I came across the other day, scrolling while lying in bed um, on, on Instagram the other day. Um, and the reason I put this uh, example here is because I'm trying to show that you don't necessarily have to have oodles of money, you know, that some of the really big brands have to, to, to spend in terms of getting the storytelling right. Now, I have never heard of My Lotus Mat before, never heard of them. The video popped up in my Instagram feed and you can see this lovely, lovely lady here. She's hundred years old and she's a yoga teacher and she stopped being able to do yoga. Um, and now she's back doing yoga again. And this whole video, and I couldn't, I couldn't help but watch it. You know, I've, got, I've actually got no interest in acupuncture, um, but I had to watch it because she was so captivated. She's this gorgeous, smiley lady. And she'd, her, she'd done her back at a various point. Um, they told a little bit more of a story. She'd had other tragedies, which they didn't go into. I got very curious. And she'd ended up getting this mat and using it as like an acupuncture mat, acupressure mat. And um, she's back to back. And, and they show her, you know, off teaching yoga again, because if she couldn't teach yoga, you know, she, that, that would be the end for her. And look, it was just great. So what was so interesting about this is I actually watched the end of this video and then the other thing I did was I actually hit learn more. Now, another really big thing to keep in mind at this kind of selling point is that sales can happen so quickly in the online world. So always make sure you make it as easy as possible to go from literally this awareness stage right through to I've bought that product. I could have actually gone all the way through and bought that product within two minutes. Make it easy. Don't put yourself too much in the way. Make it as simple as possible. If someone wants to go straight from awareness to convert, wonderful, let them. Um, but what was interesting about this one, why I, I stopped scrolling and started watching this ad of a product I'd never heard of was A, the story really you know, got my heart. Obviously, I'd like to live to be 100. They were answering a need for me that I didn't even know I had that I wanted to live to be 100. My back is a bit sore, so it was just perfectly good timing. I am into yoga, so I do wonder if I'd been targeted a little bit um, through socials because of that. Um, and the other thing is I want things to be easy. And these guys were showing me a solution that involved me lying on a mat and it would fix my back. That is a really simple sales proposition, you know, and these guys clearly don't have a heap of money. Um, and, um, and I didn't go through with the sale, which I'll talk through um, in a little bit, but it really shows the power of a simple sales message um, on, a, on a Facebook ad. You know, you can get cut through if you know what your proposition is and you've got good content around it. 
So that next stage is consideration, um, the next stage of the sales funnel. You know, they want something different at this stage. They want to know more, you know. So if they haven't just gone straight from your very first ad to buying, they need to know more. And that's completely normal. Um, at least 20%, more than 20%. It differs, interestingly, from country to country um, of prospects research really heavily. We're, we expect to be able to find out a lot of information um, about products and brands. Customers have very high expectations you need to meet them. So this is also a really good example of, yes, there's a really busy marketplace out there, but if you can do this right, this part right, you will already be ahead of some of your competitors. So just remember that, you know, if there's four to five stages here, guarantee a couple are going to muck up at least two. So try and get each stage right, because that will actually put you ahead of your competitors. So this stage very much is about that engage and inform. So you know what your sales proposition is, um, you know how you're going to solve their problem, how else do you answer those questions, how do you give them more answers. And look, there is a lot of different tools again that you can use here. Um, web content, I see it, web content as a particular content tool, that website's got to look good, it's got to look clean, and it's got to be very trustworthy. They're coming here at this point to earn, they want you to earn their trust. Um, landing pages that you might be using for um, your marketing, um, and your sales pitch, make sure it's consistent, make sure it tells them what they need to do. You know, B2B will certainly start looking at articles, um, there might be content offers, they might be offering things like um, white papers, blog posts, all of this is about giving them more information. Um, another question here is, can you build a relationship at this stage if they've come to your website? Um, certainly the B2B, um, this is where they try to build that relationship more with, hey, download our white paper, find out the latest. The big thing here is make sure you're answering your proposition. So again, it's about being um, um, consistent and quality is more important than quantity here. So um, yes, you might want to try out all these different things, but a chatbot might not be for you. So don't use a chatbot. You know, a white paper might not be for you because your industry might be saturated with white papers. Don't use it. Again, it's about test and learn and work out what message is working for your audience and what tool and then simplify it make it easy. That's how you're going to stand out at this point in time if you make that path to sales easy. And again, and I, and I keep saying this, make sure that call to action that every, every one of these tools is really clear. If they just want to jump ahead and buy, let them. Don't get in the way. Don't force them to download a white paper before they actually buy your services. Let them buy. Um, people haven't got time and if they, if they want, they, you know, it's not a linear funnel. So um, as long as you're giving them what they need, let them move through as quickly as possible. So again, measurement is power, um, you know, and you're not going to know the first time you try this stuff, you've got to try and test and learn and test and learn and refine the message and test and learn again. Um, so probably at this phase, it's more about the quality than the creativity, um, I would have to say, getting the basics right. Um, but then again, you can certainly pull a lot of um, creativity into things like white papers and articles and topics that you might be covering. So just keep thinking about how you can sound a bit different to everybody else. Again, this is fundamentals in terms of content marketing. So the next stage of the sales funnel is the buy and retain. Look, and from a content perspective, at this point, information is king. So going back to my Lotus mat that I did not buy, the reason was not the website. There was some great information on the website until I hit the actual, um, the actual shopping cart. I couldn't work out if the dollars being presented to me were Australian dollars because they seemed to know I was in Australia, you know, they were targeting me in Australia, or uh, US dollars. And it suddenly all got a little bit too hard and I dropped out. So they almost got me on a major impulse buy, but they got in my way here. So I couldn't, I, I could see that I could get free shipping, but I couldn't, and it was worldwide, but I couldn't even work out um, what currency um, they wanted me to buy in. So this is really, um, <laughs> It is still a sale. This is the actual, this is the crunchy point. Your content here has to do everything to facilitate this process being easy. Um, and so information is king. Simple information is king. The other really big thing that is king here, and I think again, um, the previous speaker was talking about this, get your e-commerce right. Do not make this stage hard for anyone. Um, it's just crazy that so much effort has gone into pushing people all this way, only to lose them here, you know, right when you want to. And as well as that kind of FAQ, the other thing to consider here is, you know, your ongoing comms. Is there an opportunity to pull um, these customers now they've bought into ongoing communications with you? 
can, are they subscribing to an email newsletter where you can keep talking to them? Um, are they going to, um, can they join a social media community? Um, and again, the other thing that, another tool, digital tool that comes in um, handy here is a really good CRM. Um, ideally, you wanna be able to track um, who that customer was. So if they come back next time, um, this is where your marketing automation starts coming in. You know them, you can personalize the experience. You know that they bought the holiday to Fiji last time uh, and then maybe that they need some travel insurance now. Um, again, it's not something you can control with your content and sales, but it's something to um, really keep in mind that it will optimize that experience. But from a content sales perspective, just facilitate the process, give them what they need. And then we have, I think it's kind of my favorite um, part of the sales funny, funnel, particularly for digital, um, which is the advocacy, right? So this, it, it's like the sales superhero. Um, you can basically get sales from this stage of the sales funnel without really doing much at all. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And you can get customers talking about your service or your product and basically parroting back, demonstrating how that, problem for them is solved, um, giving it that third party glow um, through this advocacy. And digital is, is a really powerful tool for that. Never, ever underestimate it. Um, you know, so you've got your social media advocacy, you've got customer reviews, you've got testimonials um, for B2B and case studies for B2B, really valuable loyalty programs. Although again, I'm gonna be really interested to see how they go um, post uh, pandemic. Um, ongoing customer comms, you know, are you sending them monthly emails now that they've bought your service? And what, what is in those emails? How do you continue your sales pitch going on? You need to have a plan around that and make sure the content fits that what you're trying to do at each stage. Um, community management. You know, people forget that when people are coming through on social media and asking questions, and this is actually a really big one, that's actually, it's a, it's a point of contact, contact. It's a touch point. It's a potential sales touch point. You may be able to either alleviate an issue, which means you're going to help um, advocacy for others, or you might be offered, able to offer them an upsell. Oh, do you need to, you know, um, get, get the next level up of, of a product? It's really, really important that no matter what, tool or touch points you're using, you make each one work really, really well. And remember that each time someone leaves a review, each time someone leaves a, a social media post, they're telling a story and they're telling a story about you. So you want that story to be positive, um, particularly with social media. And again, there's nothing new with this. And certainly I've seen a lot of brands start to do this a lot better. If for a long time, they really did it very badly. Um, you know, if you get critical reviews in, respond. And you're not responding always for the person that's actually left the critical review. You're actually responding for the, the future prospect who's going to go and check you out. Don't forget that people really, really like to research. So they're going to go and look at your social media. They're going to look at your, your Google reviews. They're going to go and check out how you've performed. And if they've seen that you've been responding already, um, you're gonna start winning them over. So each time you respond to even something negative, it is in some ways a sales pitch. So think about the story that you're telling. You can either tell a story that explains how your product works or how you can help them or your approach, or you can accidentally tell a story that says, we don't care, you know, and I think everyone knows which one um, that you should be using. Um, again, at this stage, you know, technology wise, another really big thing is um, that CRM or that personalization, you know, in a perfect world with um, perfect budgets. And really, honestly, I haven't necessarily seen the personalization work just yet. There's a lot of big brands trying to do it. Um, I haven't seen it succeed to the degree where I think it, um, uh, you know, like it's an, it's an absolute essential. I think it's still a nice to have and still a bit clunky, but ideally that's where you want to be moving towards um, knowing enough about that customer that each time you have that conversation, your story together keeps moving forward. So every stage needs to stack up. Your story at every stage needs to stack up, stack up. And even after the sale, your story needs to stack up. And again, I'm gonna use um, a personal example. Um, I do this because I think it's better than, um, you know, talking sometimes about your clients that might've not got it right. So I, um, again, scrolling through Instagram, got caught up by an ad for eco-friendly pegs. This was late last year. And um, I had really wanted to get some new clothes pegs. Um, I like the environmentally friendly stuff. It had a really, really great Instagram ad. It was really simple. 
um, I could see it, it was breaking plastic pegs and then you had these pegs and they were marine, marine grade steel, which sounded really impressive. I loved it. And on top of that, um, they had a sale going on, 30% off, which meant that actually these pegs were a better price than their competitors, who I was also aware of. There was a lot of pegs being advertised in Australia, uh, some in the lead up to Christmas. Um, it was easy to purchase. I did it right there on Instagram. They were an Australian company. They had a product guarantee um, and they said they were local. And I thought, oh, I've never heard of these guys before, but this looks great. They look the real deal. I'm going to buy them. So I literally had one of those yay and nay um, purchasing experiences straight away. From that point on, things got a little bit less fun. First of all, I didn't get a confirmation email, so that made me pretty nervous because I just spent my money and I didn't get anything saying, hey, you've spent your money with us. Um, the story started to fall over, basically. Then the product didn't arrive. You know, I waited 10 days and I waited two weeks. Oh, this is not so good. Uh, so I tried emailing them. I didn't get through. I tried going to social media. That got a response. Um, and so they started telling me funny stories. Their interactions with me were a bit silly. They were calling me hun and darling, which I found a little bit odd. Um, they were clearly in Australia, but you know, it wasn't good. And so after another two weeks, they offered me some free pegs. After another two weeks, I thought, no, that's it. And I went to their social media and I left a negative uh, review. Well, it was like I'd accidentally opened the floodgates because all of these other people came out with negative reviews going, oh my goodness, I'm waiting for my pegs as well. Then every now and then someone's pegs would actually arrive. They were clearly not local. Um, mine ended up arriving. They were drop shipped. There was no branding. So that whole sales story had just completely fallen over. By this point, there are, I don't know, there was a lot of people, 50, 60 different people all on their Facebook page, absolutely flipping out saying, send me back my money. They were promising to pay people back money. No one was getting refunds. We were all talking to each other. Uh, we'd, all, we'd almost formed a little community of our own. It took about two more weeks and the product disappeared. The company disappeared. The brand disappeared. Um, I was a bit luckier than some of the others. I actually got some pegs. Turns out they're not quite marine grade steel because they have actually rusted, um, but others hadn't. But when we talk about that advocacy, this is this kind of shows you how powerful it can be. We shut down this company. Yes, it was a small startup, um, and no, that was not the intent. Um, but basically, their story didn't didn't add up. You know what they were selling didn't happen, and we called them out on it. And in the end, I think there was just too much negativity. I've since then seen them pop up again. They've got a new logo, remarkably similar to the last one. Um, and I do wish them luck because hopefully they've got some of their um, some of their process sorted out. But it just goes to show you the risk if you don't get some of this stuff right. Um, things can snowball really quickly. Um, and then lastly, and again, it's very much going on to um, what um, the previous speaker was talking about. The best marketing is omnichannel. Um, our world is not just digital. So how can you create an omni experience? Your sales message or your proposition um, is just as relevant in the digital world as it is in the real world and in the real world post pandemic. So how can you find a way to be really consistent with that proposition of the problem you're trying to solve and then push it out onto other channels? You know, post pandemic, and this was just, and I'd love to hear some other people's ideas um, in the Q&As about, you know, other channels that you could potentially use. I'm, to, I'm, not, I'm not looking at um, augmented re reality or that here, although I loved those examples, um, but they certainly do require really big budgets, but it can be really simple stuff. Um, so the point of delivery, um, you know, in the post pandemic world, a lot of stuff's people, that stuff's been, you know, home delivered. Is there something you could do there? Is there some storytelling you can do around the packaging that things are being are arriving in? Um, media and public relations, hugely undervalued um, source of getting your message out there. Um, every time you get your proposition out there, you are helping push things along that sales funnel. Don't forget about media and public relations. Um, signs, bus, bus shelters. I mean, you know, the, all of this stuff works. It's the repetition of that message that's going to help you um, help it work. Um, another great one is print. You know, so many magazines have gone under. Maybe it's time to start one. You know, could you be sending your newsletter that you might have for your customers in a print format? Um, instead of emailing it to them, you know, 
it might be a little bit more expensive, but given how full people's email inboxes are, it could give you that cut through. So again, it's a think about thinking creatively about how you can get that sales message out into the real world as well, consistently. Um, and this is another example. And again, this is not one of mine. I just, I'm just a big fan of these guys um, because to me, it's a really good example of why um, you need to think bigger than digital, but your message needs to be consistent. So I'm not sure if you all heard of Nextdoor, but they're the hyper-local um, social media channel. So you can literally, you, you literally are in a social media um, group with your neighbours. Um, and I first heard about these guys in an omni-channel experience and an actual in-person conference a couple of years ago. And they had launched in Australia. They're based out of San Francisco. They're hopefully going global. And I was really interested in, in what they were talking about in how, what their difference was at the time, which was that hyper-local. Nothing's changed about that messaging. You know, they're still offering hyper-local. And, and certainly I think their time is now um, with the pandemic, everyone was having to look hyper-local. You know, many of us weren't even allowed out of um, our neighbourhoods. So hyper-local became very important. But what they did is they've stayed on message. They still are telling the same story about being hyper-local. Um, but they, and they're online, you know, so they advertise as well, but they've used PR really, really effectively. They've, in my mind, they're kind of, they're going a bit omni-channel. So I've read news stories um, about some of their neighbourhoods, you know, they've got all these great stories and they go back to the neighbourhood and they say, can we tell this story? And they say, sure. And then they give that story to the media. And next thing, they've just completely exponentially expanded their, their storytelling and their sales pitch to more and more people. Um, the other really cool thing that they did um, during the pandemic was they created a printable flyer and I used it. I printed that flyer off and I delivered it to my street um, during the worst of the pandemic here, um, letting neighbours know, who I didn't know, um, that I was um, willing to help. If I was well and healthy and they needed me to go and get medicines or they, they had to go into lockdown, I was willing to help. So it was this really wonderful example of Again, the proposition is really, really clear and really creatively done. And I suddenly had something physical and tangible in my hands. Now, my understanding is, is that their active users grew by 80% in February and March. Um, I haven't seen the latest figures, but they are absolutely going gangbusters. And it's, again, it's a good example of a clear sales proposition, great content, great storytelling, and then done really well across different channels. So, Simplicity is key. You know, it doesn't have to get too high tech. Um, so don't worry so much about budget. It's about the, the message and the, the idea and then executing it really, really well. So my takeaways for today, um, how you can help your customer is your sales pitch and content is how you tell them. Make sure that's really short, sharp, succinct, understand what that sales pitch is and it goes into everything that you then do. Digital's got a really big toolbox to help you make the most of it. Um, try different tools. Don't do everything at once, but try different tools. It's amazing what we, we know so much about our customers. Use them. Um, and so again, insights that can, can supercharge your pitch at every stage. You know your customer, um, answer their needs. Um, think about them first. And again, you would have heard everyone talk about that. It's basic stuff, but so many people don't get it right. So it's why we, we all say it over and over again. Um, make it easy to buy, particularly in a digital world from the minute you make. Don't get in their way. If they want to go from yay to buy, let them do that uh, and make it really easy. And creativity and quality can be your, a big point of difference in a crowded marketplace. Um, and I can't stress that enough. And if you don't have the creativity in-house, go externally. There are lots of great ideas, people, agencies out there, people like us, people, there's lots of agencies out there. They, they do some really great stuff. And sometimes if you know what your sales pitch is, let someone else apply a creative lens. You can get a little bit close to your product occasionally. Let them apply a creative lens and see if what they can't come up um, for you. And then just remember, you're going to have to refresh and refresh. Don't stop changing um, and don't stop being creative. And then finally, the big thing is, if you really want to supercharge your sales, is to go omni. Go where others aren't. You know, make the most of, of what's out there. And... Um, and have fun because, you know, um, it is a crowded marketplace, but if you know what you're doing, um, you can really get some cut through. And good luck. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Rebecca.
All right, uh, we're just going to take two questions very quickly here, then after that we'll move on to the next speaker. So this question is, hi Rebecca, can you explain some examples of good content? Good content. Oh, tough one. <laughs> <laughs> good content. Um, okay, good content is anything that actually gets your message through or engages your audience. So when we talk about insights, you know, that's part of what you need to be looking at. Um, how many page, you know, views have I had? How much time did someone spend on the page? That's what you know what good quality content is. It answers the need of your audience and they engage with it. You know, it can be a social media post, it can be a, a web blog, um, it, it can be a conference. If they're actually engaging with it, you know it's good content and you have all the insights to keep seeing what's working. Um, so you need to apply those insights per each piece of content. But most good content at its heart has a good story to tell and will touch that person that's listening. Absolutely. I think that's very, very good advice. And that's a very nice question as well. I know it was a little bit broad, but I think you managed to narrow it down very eloquently. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this next one is from Yong Ng. Now, this question is, how should narrative fallacy bias be kept to a minimum while creating storytelling that resonates and targets? Sorry, can you just repeat that? How should... Narrative fallacy bias be kept to a minimum while creating storytelling that resonates and targets. How can, how can, sorry. Uh, I'm just missing the first part of the question. While creating. Oh, yeah. Is it in there? Uh, can you just repeat it for me again? Sorry, I can't see it in the chat. I'm looking in there now. Um, you can actually check the Q&A box. It's right beneath the screen. It should say Q&A. Ah, it's the Q&A. Sorry, I'm in the wrong box. Yeah. How should narrative fallacy bias... Oh, gosh, that's a technical one for today. Um, so, um, look, this is, again, it, it's got to go back to understanding your audience and test and learn. Um, so I think one of the best things I've got in my experience is um, being background in journalism. And when I first started as a journalism, we didn't even have bylines. You really had to take yourself out of the picture. They didn't care about you. Your editor didn't care about you. Your readers didn't care about you. It's about trying to really put yourself into your audience's shoes um, to get rid of the bias. And then you need to be really honest with yourself in your, um, in your measurement to see whether that's working and be really open to changing your approach. Again, don't get too caught up on what, you know, people fall in love with their ideas. If your idea is not working, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It's just not the right idea for now. Um, and so that's about being really personally disciplined, I think. I think there's a lot of self-reflection involved as well. So thank you so much for answering that. Uh, we're going to have to wrap things up now and move on to our next speaker. But uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for being such a delight. And I found your presentation absolutely detailed. And I think you've pushed a lot of people who are watching today really out of their comfort zones to try and experiment, uh, experiment in new things. And for that, we'd like to thank you so much. And also, quick side note, I love the fact that we're actually tweeting. We're like in the same kind of <laughs> outfit, <laughs> the same background. <laughs> so Perfect. thank you so much. Bye -bye. Yeah, I actually find that really kind of cute. But thank you so much for being a part of the Singapore Marketing Fest. Um, hopefully, we'll see you soon. Stay safe and um, enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Appreciate <laughs> it. Bye. Exobytes. Grow your business online.